It is seven o'clock on April 13th, and I will call the continued public hearing of the 40B application of Jeffrey Engler of SLV School Street LLC to be known as Sanctuary at Manchester by the Sea for a comprehensive permit under Mass General Laws Chapter 40B, Sections 20 to 23, to construct 136 unit apartment complex for which the Manchester Housing Finance Agency issued a project eligibility decision on September 16th, 2021 at School Street, Assessor's Map number 43, lot number 18, filed with the town clerk on September 27th, 2021. I am Sarah Malish, the chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I have with me tonight, uh, Catherine Howe, John Benares, Brian Salisi, James Mitchell, and John, Sean Zahn. Um, Jim Dietrich is out of town with bad internet connection, so he will not be joining us tonight. Um, so in accordance with the agenda, um, we will start with the engine, engineering peer review. Um, I think Matt Cote or Cody, I get the name wrong every time, is on the... Yep, it's Cody, that's okay. Cody, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So we received updates from you on April 6th, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, can we just kind of go, can you walk us through that and kind of highlight the areas of concern, things you think we need more information on, et cetera? Sure. Um, so um, or the initial application had included a uh, wastewater treatment facility um, sited in the rear of the property. They've since changed that um, approach and are going with a pump station. Uh, they'll now be located just off of School Street. Um, we don't take any, you know, necessarily any exception to that. The only thing I mean to bring to the board's attention is that pump station will require some waivers now um, for under, you know, for underground storage of, um, you know, having like underground tanks um, within within that district. Um, so again, so, so like from an engineering standpoint, there isn't necessarily anything wrong with the pump station, though I should note that the pump station isn't necessarily designed at this point. It's just kind of a black box, you know, kind of for future design by others. Um, but I just want to bring to the board's attention though, again, like, you know, to that end where the board needs to, you know, grant a waiver for the structure, it, it probably does make sense to have see some kind of design or some, you know, like some dimensions or sizes or, you know, just how impactful that station will be um, when considering the waiver request. Um, along those same lines, there, um, we brought up last time a question about the water supply um, and just the grade, you know, the, you know, the, the, so the water and sewer both need to come from the other side of the highway. Um, so they're extending like long dead ends um, to this, to, to this site. Um, and there is quite an elevation change between School Street and where, you know, the finished floor of the proposed facility. So again, the, the applicant has kind of come back and saying there'll, there'll be a booster station that will, you know, increase the pressure to kind of get up the hill and, and, and make up for any pressure losses or differences they're going to have. But again, having that ancillary structure um, within, the, within the roadway setbacks is going to require some, a waiver from the board. Again, it's just, you know, it's not, it's not fully designed. It's just kind of conceptual at this point. But to, again, to my previous point, if the board's gonna grant a waiver, we'd like to see a little more information on that. Again, sizes, dimensions, how impactful that structure will be, you know, when considering the waiver request before the board. Um, I did speak with uh, Chuck Dam, who is the DPW director about these, you know, about both water and sewer. He also shares kind of the same, like, you know, there's not necessarily anything wrong with them, but he is also going to want to see, you know, a more detailed design. He's going to have to review and approve them. Um, he's going to want to see some capacity analysis, which we would agree with. Um, just because they can get the sewer 
you know, to like the existing, you know, sewer south of the highway. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that sewer has capacity for all this new flow. And same with the water, you know, like it, it might re it require um, some upgrades to the system. Uh, Chuck mentioned that there's like some six inch pipe that they might be connecting into, which is typically small. Uh, you, you typically wouldn't see anything less than an eight inch. And for a facility the size, it might even be 10 inch. So again, like, like again, none of this has been figured out. None of this has been designed. Um, but we're gonna, you know, you're gonna want to see that at some point. But, but conceptually, what they're proposing, you know, there isn't anything wrong with it. It's just gonna need some more design detail. Um, so that's something that, you know, we would recommend that the board condition, and obviously as they get into a building permit, those things would be figured out. Um, another issue, so originally we had questioned, you know, the amount of impervious area on the site. Um, the applicant has come back and it kind of revised those calculations to get within, you know, not, not, re not necessarily requesting a waiver um, that they were before. But again, I believe the board is seeking or at least looking for some information on a sidewalk, um, you know, along the driveway up to the facility. Um, we reviewed that sidewalk and conceptually again, mm -hmm. have no, no concerns with it, but the impervious area created by that sidewalk potentially pushes them, you know, over that threshold for the impervious area, and then would push them back into that waiver category. Um, so again, something for the board to consider when, um, you know, if that sidewalk is something you want to see, it's going to require a waiver of the applicant um, based on the additional impervious area that's going to be added. Um, we had also noted some, you know, issues or just looking for some clarification on like how trash would picked up and snow storage and other kind of ancillary, you know, activities. Those comments have all been addressed, at least to our satisfaction, we're comfortable with what they're proposing. It's just more of kind of an operation and maintenance on their end once the facility is up and running, if it goes forward. Um, we reviewed um, some the revised stormwater information. Um, a lot of our concerns or questions were answered, um, but there are, there are still some that remain. Um, specifically regarding like groundwater elevations and some of the uh, test pit information. We know additional test pit information has been provided, but the applicant is also committed to providing even more um, specific to the locations of the infiltration systems and more notably the bioretention areas um, where information is kind of still sparse at this point. Um, at least um, from a conceptual stage, um, a lot of the test pits they did, um, they didn't hit groundwater. Um, being at least 10 feet deep. And, and at least I can say for the infiltration system, that's gonna be an area of fill. So the grades being raised there. So there seems like they're gonna have an adequate um, separation of groundwater, but we'd still want all that stuff kind of confirmed and worked out you know, as the design progresses. But um, initial indications are they're gonna have you know, the, required, the requirements for that. And um, I guess finally, uh, the geotechnical report, um, that was done by Northeast Geotechnical had requested some, you know, additional information from a geotechnical standpoint regarding like foundations and retaining walls and you know the information that would be needed to progress that design. It doesn't seem like any of that's been provided. Um, we understand that. Um, it is something that you know would probably be rolled into the building permit process when they go for like you know foundation as builds and slabs and those kinds of things. Um, but just to note to the board that um, those concerns brought up by Northeast Street Technical don't appear to be addressed at this point. But if there's anything more specific that the board would like to talk about. Uh, I, guess, I, I guess I have two questions for you. Sure. Um, one is, can the blasting and the change in the topography impact the drainage plan, for instance, if the blasting created new fissures or you know something like that, would that impact the overall great drainage plan? Not in my opinion. Again, where they're putting the, the major infiltration system in the rear of the property is going to be an area of fill. Um, so I don't think they're really going to need to blast in that area. You know, they're bringing grade up in that area. Um, so at least for at least for that, you know, major part of the infrastructure, I don't see that as being an issue. Okay. Um, now, the other question I have is, of course, this most recent submission from the applicant requested a waiver to connect to municipal sewer. Correct. If, if the board 
decided not to grant that waiver, would that impact your peer review? Well, yeah, I guess well, then, they're, they're, then they're going back to the treatment facility, like the on-site treatment facility. Right. And, we, some, and we, we initially had some questions about that, you know, its proximity to wetlands and different things, it being in the, it, it, like where it was. Um, and it, like there was, you know, multiple fields as far as like kind of like, um, as far as multiple leaching fields that were depicted. Um, so if those fields and kind of potential impacts environmentally come back into play, that would have, that would affect our review. Okay. Um, I guess taking a step back to the blasting point you brought up, um, yeah. another thing we had initially um, discussed or asked was, you know, for a construction management plan, um, we understand that that's usually something that might come a little further down the road, um, considering, you know, usually it's, you know, once a contractor's on board, it's their means and methods, and that's when those kinds of issues would be worked out as far as like, you know, trucking routes and different things and how they, you know, it's typically not done before that kind of those people are on board and part of the project. But we do note that again, relative to blasting, that there would, there does potentially seem to be some blasting near the vernal pools. Um, and the vernal pools would be down like kind of a, you know, down a slope. And I guess we, we would be concerned or want, would want to see some kind of construction management or what the plan is for protecting those vernal pools during blasting events. Um, that's something we feel that is, you know, reasonable for the board, because again, relative to waivers, the applicants requesting waivers from setbacks and vernal pools, et cetera. Um, so again, for the board to be informed to um, act on those waivers, we feel it's appropriate to maybe get a little more of construction management plan type information uh, regarding the vernal pools in, in reference to blasting and like the proximity and how those, you know, how those areas would be protected and or mitigated, you know, if something goes wrong during those blasting events. Okay, thank you. Um, John Benares, do you have any questions, comments? Um, yeah, I've, I've just sort of latched onto this, this, the idea of the construction management plan. I understand that, you know, this, something like this might come a little later as a, a GC is on board, but, you know, at, at this point of the game, I think it's, we should have some sort of understanding of how much fill is going to leave the site, how much will remain on the site. I, I just kind of find how to believe that when you go into an endeavor of this scale, that, you know, you should have more of an idea of, um, you know, how many uh, tons of, of fill will leave the site, how many, you know, how many truckloads, et cetera. Um, because I'm not comfortable, um, you know, moving forward with something like this without that sort of information. Um, I understand that the, the logistics of it will get, you know, hashed out again as, as a GC is on board, but I'd like to have a better understanding of, you know, how much fill is going to be moved off site, how much fill will, will be, you know, scattered throughout the site, you know, um, and I think it's, you know, it, it, it's hard to estimate, but when you have a scope that includes 25 foot retaining walls, then you would think, okay, well, how much of that will be retaining fill? So, uh, you know, I've, again, I'm just not comfortable uh, moving forward without that information. Um, and I also just note that the geotechnical issues were not addressed uh, as Mr. Cody just explained. Um, and then throughout all these comments, you know, there's a, uh, a reference to the fact that the, the applicant's now requesting a, a tie into the SOAR system. Uh, and so that's something that I'm trying to, to digest as well, because I don't know what's more feasible. Um, I'm not an engineer, so um, I'm just curious to see how that discussion goes as we learn more about that change in the scope. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Brian? No, at this point, I'm just uh, making a list of uh, questions. I'll, I'll better be able to address a lot of these things uh, a little later on down the road. Thank you. Okay. Um, James? I have a couple of questions uh, as a follow-up to what John Benares just mentioned about cut and fill. Um, you know, my understanding is that you know, during an engineering peer review, we would be looking at all aspects uh, that involved or considered engineering. And, to my view, 
massive retaining walls, uh, foundations, uh, structures of that size all have to be designed and engineered and they, they have capacities and volumes of fill. Um, how can we consider an engineering review complete or an engineering peer review when we don't even have a design for these structures? That's, that's my question. And I understand the chicken and egg nature of these things, um, that, that we'll get those answers later. But if, if the engineering is done down the road, do those structures then go through their own separate peer review? Yeah, if, yeah, if that question, yeah, I mean, during, I mean, during the building building permitting process, you know, the building inspector or whatever is, is going to want to see, you know, detailed designs of those, of that infrastructure for sure. Um, it's hard, again, it's, I mean, to the, to John's point about, like, you know, earth, you know, truck volume and like earthwork and they just independent of the general contractor, that is information that would have seem to be you know available or, or could be generated you know indep independent of the you know who's selected as the contractor the earthworks the earthwork um it could be estimated um for sure um but again to like you know specific designs of retaining walls and foundations and yeah that geotechnic information will be required like will be needed to to complete those designs but the fact that they're not done now doesn't necessarily give us pause because they will be like thoroughly reviewed at a later, you know, wh whether the wall, you know, it's, it's I'm trying to think, you know, the, the wall will be designed adequately for the condition because the building inspector will enforce that. It's not just, they're not just be able to get away with a, you know, a substandard design for the wall just because you've granted them the permit now. I mean, it's, it's just, just, you know, like it's, you know, the, like you kind of mentioned the chicken and egg, you know, like they're not going to go through the time and effort and expense to fully design every nut and bolt of the building before they know they have their permit and, you know, or, or kind of go forward. It's, it's, it's the nature of these 40 V projects. Um, the plans are, you know, you know, but I think by the regulation, they, they're, you know, they're quote unquote preliminary. Um, nothing is final. It's just to kind of give the board a sense of what's coming and like, and to give you a comfort with what they're actually going to build, but for sure, you know, a building inspector or you know, a building commissioner is going to thoroughly vet those designs. You know, if the project moves forward. And, and I guess, and again, understanding that there's a chicken and egg nature to this conversation, it seems that we are getting the benefit of uh, peer reviews for traffic, for conservation, environmental, and it just seems like this is one thing that's of critical nature that we will not, even though it meets the code and the building inspector will oversee that it's enforced, yeah. we're not getting the benefit of a peer review on that design. Like I said, we have, we have Northeast Geotechnical on board. It's just, the, just, just the, you know, the information to date hasn't been provided. If, if that's, you know, if that's the board's, you know, what the, how they want to proceed. But I guess I would say it, it isn't atypical for that information to not be provided at this point if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Can I just chime in? The, give, the thing that gives me the greatest concern is that this is a site that doesn't have a lot of slack, meaning that this building is, is being designed to fit perfectly within these parameters. And so if we approve this thing, and then, you know, during this, you know, when the, during the engineering and the design phase as things are being, you know, finalized, if, if the building needs to move or the driveway needs to move or anything needs to, you know, um, shift around because, um, because of, of, you know, issues underground or whatever, then it's gonna have a, an impact on its surrounding environment. It's not like, you know, we have just acres of, of surrounding land where we can just shift things around. I mean, the way it's designed now, it, it fits, you know, it's, it's very tight. And, you know, every consultant has mentioned that um, you know, in their, in their reviews and then when they discuss this. Um, so that's why um, I, I get concerned about this type of stuff. Madam Chair, can I speak just for one sec to maybe put a few concerns at ease? Just yes, Mr. Sure. sure. Uh, for the record, Jeff Engler from SLV School Street representing the applicant. Um, we can endeavor to provide a preliminary cut and fill analysis um, I'm not sure what the board's concern is because the cut and fill analysis will be what it's going to be. Uh, we are trying to balance the site as much as possible, meaning whatever 
fill we need, we're taking from the areas that we're cutting on site. I couldn't say exactly what that will be, but it's not like all the cut of the excavation is leaving the site because we do need a substantial amount of fill. So we can provide without a general contractor, uh, Mr. Cody's correct, you know, we can provide a, a, a high level overview, uh, but the cut and fill is gonna be what the cut and fill is. Uh, also, I would uh, respectfully uh, just disagree with uh, Mr. Uh, Benares a little bit in that removing the, converting to the, the um, tying into the municipal sewer. In fact, we now have a lot of slack in the plateau. Um, we may not have much slack relative to the location of the roadway, but we could shift this footprint if we wanted. I know Mr. Bomer uh, indicated otherwise during his peer review, but in fairness to him, I don't think he had the full information. But I, I've talked to my team about that. And if we needed to shift the building slightly forward, slightly back to the left, to the right, we could do that. We don't think we'll need to, but this notion that the building has no slack or cannot move, that, that's not accurate. So that's, I just wanted to address those few points right now. Um, and you know, we can speak uh, more globally to the Fields and Thomas's peer, re peer review when uh, Mr. Cody is concluded. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sean, do you have any questions? No, the only the only one of the concerns I have is now about the the sidewalk with the impervious addition and the waiver that would be required for that and effects of the stormwater runoff. That's one of my concerns right now. I just still gathering some information here. Okay. Uh, Catherine. Hi, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Okay, great. Um, see you too. Awesome. Um, my questions really um, are with respect to the to the runoff and to, to whether we're modeling on a 25 year storm or, or 100 year storm. Um, there seem to be some inconsistencies in the data here. Um, and so I'm just, I'm not really clear on what we're modeling for and, and whether we meet the criteria for that model. So in some places we seem to be modeling for a 25 year storm and other places it seems to be modeling for a hundred year storm. Um, and so that's not really a very clear question, but it's noted inconsistency. And I think we need some clarity around, um, what we're modeling for, and then also whether the proposed model meets the criteria we're looking at. Mr. Cody, can you respond to that? So, so for pipe sizing, um, you typically model to a 25 year storm event and structure sizing, um, but for like the basins and the you know, uh, uh, infiltration systems, we typically wanna see under, you know, the, you're gonna store all that volume. Um, you know, the difference being in the, in the 25 year storm event, you know, you want the pipes to be flowing clear, you know, like if, they, if they can handle the 25 year storm event, they're gonna flow without like surcharging. Um, the, you know, the 50 and 100 year storms, it, it wouldn't be uncommon or unreasonable for those pipes to surcharge. So I guess that's the difference, if that makes sense. Uh, and, and, uh, and, to, I mean, and like I said, we do have some questions on the modeling. We do still have some questions on the stormwater, but overall, it seems like they're headed in the right direction and they have a, a you know, a, a conceptually a feasible design. Are you done, Catherine? Well, I was just going to ask a question. I mean, so we're talking about runoff and the modeling, and I'm wondering if there's a significant impact environmentally from the runoff, if we, um, what the difference is between a 25-year modeling and a 100-year modeling when you're looking at the environmental impact of the runoff. There, there really shouldn't be any, because, I mean, if the, if the system has the capacity for the 100-year storm, as far as from a volume standpoint, it's going to have the volume for the 25 year storm. And we were, and, we, and, and a 100 year storm, we'd want to see like very little discharge from the system. So, so are, you, are you telling me it does currently have the capacity for a 100 year storm? I believe, I, I, I'd have to double check, but I believe so. I believe the modeling shows they do, it's, it's designed for a 100 year storm. 
Okay, the thank you. From, from, a, from a volume perspective. Right, thank you. Sure. Um, I'll now open it up to the public. Um, oh, it's coming. Madam, Madam Chair, can I just make a comment um, before we go to the public, just so I'm clear? Um, uh, Mr. Cody issued uh, the letter on uh, April 6th. I think um, it's our intention to provide one more volley back to him okay. relative to some of his outstanding questions and issues, and to the extent you know we can provide um, some additional data. Um, so that's uh, I just want to make sure that that's consistent with um, with Mr. Cody's expectations as well as the board's expectations, specifically the the I mean because we have two Fields and Thomas. Uh, activities going on. We got the you know site and civil and you know geotech, and then we got environmental over here. So the the April sixth letter um, is site civil, and we'll be responding to that and volleying it back to Mr. Cody for a, you know another review, hopefully narrowing the list of outstanding items just like we did with environmental partners. Um, so that's our that's our plan. Hopefully that's consistent with your expectations. Yeah, so I think my hope is that um, we'll be able to close out the public comment on engineering by the May 25th meeting. That's what I'm kind of thinking in, in my head. Okay. Okay, that's what we're aiming for. Um, Zoom is showing a Diane Rodier. Rodier. Um, would you please state your name and address, please? Diane Rodier, 13 Rosedale Ave in Manchester. Um, my question relates to some of the things that I've been reading um, about the sewage treatment facility that we have in Manchester is currently um, at or near maximum capacity. So does the project, um, are they building their own treatment facility? Because this is like, if they're not, it's kind of a moot point because our town sewer will never handle that. That's um, my question. Yeah, thank you, Diane. Um, the original project was to have an on-site um, treatment facility. Um, at the last response, they came back and asked to connect to the municipal sewer, and we right. will be discussing that on April 27th. Okay, and thank we'll you. And we'll public comment at that point in time on the sewer. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Daniel Hill. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board. <clears throat> For the record, my name is uh, Dan Hill. I'm a land use attorney and I represent the Manchester Essex Conservation Trust. Um, I, I have a few questions and a few comments. And, and I also wanted to introduce tonight uh, two of our experts that have been hired by the, Ma by the Manchester Essex Conservation Trust, uh, Scott Horsley. Uh, a hydrologist and uh, John Chessia, a civil engineer. Um, we have submitted comment letters from uh, both individuals uh, this afternoon. Uh, certainly don't expect anyone to have read them by now, um, but we wanna put our concerns on the record. Um, and I wanted to, if I could, uh, Madam Chair, just first ask a question to the chair because I, I, I was kind of puzzled by, frankly, several of the comments that were just made by Mr. Cody uh, because they're really, inconsistent with our own review of the plans. And uh, one comment he made was that that groundwater was encountered in most of the test pits that were dug on the site. Is, is Did I hear that correctly? No, they, no, no groundwater was detected in most of them. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Okay. That's, that's consistent with, with what we saw as well. <laughs> And uh, with respect to the, the sewer and, and water issues, you know, Mr. Cody had, you know, made, made a comment that, that, it, that there didn't seem to be a problem with, with capacity and certainly that they would uh, have to prove capacity at some later date. Um, and, and I wanted to just raise, raise an alarm um, about that comment as well as what seems to be a several comments that were made in the peer review letters suggesting that a lot of these substantive issues can be deferred until a later date. The, the law is very clear that 
the zoning board may not defer judgment on issues of substance to after the permit's been issued. They cannot put conditions on the permit that would re require the applicant to go through a, an, an additional review and approval process. If the board wants to ensure that certain things are addressed such as sewer capacity or construction management planning, those type of issues have to be addressed during the public hearing uh, and reviewed during the hearing. Uh, the, the Housing Appeals Committee uh, is crystal clear on this point. Uh, it has issued several decisions uh, on this issue, uh, most recently in March of 2021, when it released, <clears throat> I think five or six decisions on the same day. And virtually all of those decisions, uh, the committee held unequivocally that boards could not impose what's called conditions subsequent, meaning conditions that require the developer to come back before a board and seek approval of something like a construction management plan or sewer capacity. So I, I think that may differ from the practice of planning boards and, and perhaps zoning boards in, in, in normal course, <clears throat> but under chapter 40B, that just can't happen. So I, I wanna stress the importance of making sure we vet all of these issues now during this public hearing process in the limited amount of time that we have within the 180 day deadline. And for that reason, I, I've, I've articulated this before and I will again tonight, even though I know sewer is on the agenda for the next meeting, it, it's critical that the applicant provide sewer, a, a sewer capacity analysis that includes uh, capacity availability in the pipes as well as the, the actual treatment plant. And those questions have not even been addressed, let alone answered. The treatment plant we've, we've been told has a permitted capacity of 600 Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill, I don't want to discuss sewer at all tonight. We're going to do that on April 27th. I'm sorry. It's, it's a volatile issue and I want to put it on, I have it on the agenda for April 27th. Okay. I, I just wanted to put everybody on notice that there ha this work to, has to be done. And the sooner it gets started, the better. I don't want to wait until two weeks and, and make this point. So I, I'm sorry, but I, I felt it's very important to get that out there. Um, <clears throat> with respect to uh, drainage, uh, which is the topic du jour, um, Mr. Chesia is going to Mr. Horsley is going to comment on the adequacy of the test pits. Uh, and Mr. Chesia has a list of about 40 deficiencies that he's flagged on the stormwater design, uh, which obviously is, is a little bit different from what we heard just now from the peer review. in the overall hydrology of the site. Thank you. Scott, are you there? I am, should I okay. proceed? Yep. Go ahead, Mr. Horsel. Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Scott Horsley. I am a hydrologist and just by way of introduction, I have more than 30 years experience working prim primarily nationally for the US Environmental Protection Agency worked for many state governments, many, many municipalities, uh, have worked for developers as well. Pine Hills is my uh, long-term developer client that I'm happy to share uh, details on later, um, and as well as I'm an adjunct professor at Tufts and Harvard, and I serve on multiple uh, advisory committees for the Mass Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, so what I'd like to do, I did submit a letter, as uh, Attorney Hill mentioned, and I would just briefly like to touch on three points, if I may, and it won't take much of your time. But um, as we all know, the test pits were just recently made available, despite the fact that they were uh, done uh, quite some time ago. Uh, and uh, I've looked at those test pits, and as has already been indicated tonight, uh, only four of the 29 test pits uh, encountered groundwater. Now there's a couple different ways to interpret that. One is the groundwater is deep and not an issue. Um, that's not the way I interpret it and I'll tell you why. And that's because groundwater fluctuates, groundwater levels fluctuate and we're in glacial till and, and glacial till, it fluctuates a lot by a, a matter of 10 feet or more seasonally. I did look at the, uh, there's a network of index, so-called index wells that the US Geological Survey uh, monitors for the purpose of being able to determine whether or not a, a given test pit date is a high level, a medium level, or a low level. 
And I can tell you from having looked at those index wells relative to the two dates of the test pits, which were April 8th, 2020 and, and November 18th, 2020, that the uh, water levels could be expected to be to three to, three to six feet higher uh, on the a high water table condition than on those dates. So uh, those test pits really don't provide uh, or very limited information in terms of groundwater. And I think it's, it would be uh, mistaken to interpret that as meaning the groundwater is uh, deep and there's plenty of room for uh, these stormwater infiltration systems. So clearly, uh, and as I think the applicant said that, uh, I would also suggest that um, instead of test pits, monitoring wells be installed with pressure transducers. And I'll tell you why, uh, because as I already mentioned, groundwater levels go up and down quite a bit, especially in glacial till. So if, if you don't happen to hit the right, right date on a test pit, and I don't think they have here, uh, you're not gonna observe that high water. Uh, they also, the test pit data also uh, did not note any mottling in the soils, which is another way you can estimate high groundwater conditions. So that doesn't work here either. So I would suggest that uh, a series of monitoring wells with pressure transducers such that we can watch water levels on a frequent basis uh, would really be the best way to uh, determine water levels on the site, which I would, which I'm going to, as I'll get to, I think is critically important to the design and certainly the evaluation of the project. So my second point is uh, in the area of the proposed infiltration system, uh, which is a well, quite a large infiltration system, I might add, uh, by concentrating all the stormwater in one place, uh, undoubtedly you're gonna have something called groundwater mounding, which means when you, when you uh, discharge the stormwater into the ground, uh, the water levels are gonna come up even higher than the ones I've already mentioned, the seasonal high groundwater. And by the way, the regulatory requirements are in fact to use that high groundwater as your base elevation to do your design and assessment. So uh, this project will need a groundwater mounting analysis to determine uh, the effects of the, uh, what I would characterize as a large amount of stormwater. I, hard to believe anybody would not characterize it as that, but we'll see. Uh, certainly a uh, focused in one place here and um, so a groundwater mounting analysis would be really a critical point to make here, or evaluation to make. And then my third and last point is, um, and I should, I should have mentioned at the beginning, um, because this data was just made available recently, what I'm telling you tonight is, as I characterize in my letter, really a preliminary analysis. There's a lot to this plan, as has already been indicated. Uh, the site is complicated, uh, shallow depth of bedrock, there's fractured flow through rock. There is, um, uh, I think, high fluctuating water tables. So there's a lot to look at here, a lot of wetlands. So my comments tonight are really just focused on these couple of things. But item number three really refers to the what I'll call the interior wetland uh, in the in the parcel. And I know they've they've provided other numbers and names, but I'll just characterize it as that. Uh, this interior wetland has a couple of vernal pools that show in it. And I've looked at the drainage analysis and essentially what is happening here is um, that wetland and the vernal pools are highly dependent on uh, ambient water levels and flow rates. That's why the wetland is there. And more specifically, that's why the vernal pool is able to be there. Uh, the proposed plan uh, changes the drainage area to this wetland substantially. And I'll just refer to the numbers from the drainage report. Uh, under existing basis, drainage area E4, E standing for existing, measures 100, I'll, I'll, run, I'll round off the numbers, 185,000 square feet. Under the proposed plan, P4, which uh, proposed, uh, is 123,000, uh, excuse me, 124,000 square feet. That's a reduction of 33%. Uh, now that's just the drainage area. That doesn't that, uh, that's, doesn't get into the groundwater, although we can assume for at least preliminary purposes until more data is provided, which I presume they will provide, uh, we can estimate the groundwater drainage to be coincident with the surface drainage. Therefore, a uh, reduction of 33% of groundwater base flow to that wetland system uh, is gonna have a dramatic effect on water levels, flow rates, and habitat. Uh, so that's what I can read so far from the plans. Um, I, I, I hope we'll see more groundwater information. I think we need it. And, and that will certainly help, uh, help detail this. My letter does conclude with suggesting that a uh, hydrologic budget for this interior wetland system be provided by the applicant. 
I will probably suggest some more things for other wetlands once I get a chance to review them. But as I already said, my focus has been on this interior wetland. And I would suggest that hydrologic budget should include seasonal changes because as um, I think any of the wetland experts will testify, vernal pools are highly dependent on, on seasonal changes in water levels. So the hydrologic budget is something that uh, I think will be critical. Uh, as I said, the drainage plans indicate as much as a 33% change, that's significant. Um, so that's my recommendation that a detailed hydrologic budget be prepared for this wetland. And I'll stop there, Madam Chair, unless you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tallerman, you've had your hand raised. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just a brief comment in response to Mr. Could you Hill's just please comment. Uh, state your name? Sorry, and... um, Jay Tallerman, I'm counsel to the applicant. And just a brief comment to add a, a little bit of um, substance to the comment that Mr. Hill had with respect to conditions subsequent. We wouldn't suggest, because it wouldn't be good for us, that the board impose a condition subsequent that would allow the board to get a second bite at the apple or some agent of the board to get a second bite at the apple that could affect the project. That has been ruled by the Housing Appeals Committee to be improper. There's some ambiguity in the case law on that, but that has been ruled to be improper. However, conditions subsequent that allow a board's agents, engineers, the town's professionals, to assess a more detailed plan that is consistent with the, the plans and consistent with normal practice has been expressly endorsed by the Housing Appeals Committee in those same decisions. So it's important not to conflate those two kinds of conditions. It's when we suggest that something can be left and when Mr. Cody suggests that something can be left for further review, that is the normal kind of process, especially in a situation where there is um, a, a set of preliminary plans. This is, there's, not no, there's not a separate standard for 40B. It's the same standard as other projects, except that it's accepted under 40B that the plans are necessarily preliminary. So it's understood and expressly authorized by the Housing Appeals Committee that normal conditions for technical review that help further um, the board's decision approving a project are totally proper and remain proper. So I just wanna state that we're inviting conditions that will allow your experts to conduct further review. But of course, as Mr. Engler stated, we are going above and beyond and expect to provide much of the detail, even though it's hardly preliminary in response to Mr. Cody's, as well as your other experts um, review here. Thank you. Madam Chair, I had John Chestia on deck here to, to speak on drainage. Can he speak? Sure. Thank you. For no more than five minutes. <clears throat> okay. Um, John Chestia, for the record, I own uh, Chestia Consulting Engineer. So I'm a professional licensed engineer in Massachusetts, have been for 30 some odd years. Um, I will talk just a minute or less about the walls. One of the walls actually contains the subsurface infiltration system. Uh, the base of the wall is about seven feet below the subsurface infiltration system. The detail of the wall that was provided, which is granted preliminary, has tie backs. And we know the fill behind those has to be granular. Uh, I think that it's uh, appropriate for the board to understand how the two interact and that there won't be breakout through the wall, there won't be breakout on the very steep slope below. Uh, DEP has guidance on that sort of thing. And I think that's a critical issue that should be addressed at this stage. Um, relative to the stormwater, I'll sort of go through the standards. Standard one is about outlets. The outlet from bioretention basin one is within 100 feet of a vernal pool, flat out, not allowed. It's within 10 to 12, uh, five to 10 feet of the wetland. It's on a very steep slope. It's uh, inconsistent in the design detail and uh, the plan, and that wouldn't comply flat out. Not a question. Standard two, you are supposed to assess runoff to each vernal pool. They don't assess it to vernal pool A, which is sort of the one up high central to the site. Uh, the other ones 
kind of, but uh, you need to do a water balance to them and you need to assess that there's not an impact. So the runoff conditions under standard two, there's a lot of comments I have in my letter. Uh, one of them, of course, is relative to the soil group. They say it's a hydrologic soil group D and that likely is the case with this ledge outcrops, et cetera, but all of their testing, none of it is hydrologic soil group D. So you should adjust your runoff based on the soils you get. They're claiming a fast infiltration rate in the ground, yet they say that it has a surface condition of a D. It's just not consistent, it's not appropriate. Um, bioretention basins in the DEP handbook are not rate control structures, period. They're using it for rate control. Uh, the one of them that has a, theoretically has infiltration, the plans again, not clear on this as far as the details go, but bioretention basin one, the bottom of it is in ledge. It wouldn't have any infiltration in ledge. The bottom of the system where the stone is would be the infiltration surface. It's not gonna give you two feet of separation and, or from ledge, it would be in the ledge. You'd have to blast it to build it. Doesn't comply. They also use, um, for bioretention system two, they use a, an infiltration rate, but it's actually supposed to be just a treatment system. Again, it's not a rate control device <clears throat> and it's the flow through the media is what they should use if they were gonna use anything. Part of it's in the town right away. Does the town want that in the right away? They have the overflow spillway stone right in the right away. It's part of the design. They have a pipe tying in to the middle of the road they have permit for that. That's something the town does not have to grant is my understanding. They need a license for that. Um, I think that's not accurate. Recharge is the next standard, standard three. <clears throat> so they did a, what a lot of people do. Here's the impervious area, here's the recharge. They neglect to include the hole that they're filling. There's a large hole that's in the sub areas that's I believe called E5. That's recharge that exists today that they're gonna fill and they don't even consider it. Um, I think there's an issue there that that should be addressed. Um, <clears throat> relative to the other standards, standard four, that usually can be dealt with. I think there's some issues there, but those are minor. Critical areas though, this house, this place is surrounded by vernal pools. Read the details, read the requirements for doing work near a vernal pool. Water balance, Wildlife habitat study, you gotta prove you're not impacting the vernal pool. There's a lot of information that does seem to be lacking relative to those issues that should be addressed in the, um, in the submittal. And I agree also that there should be a construction plan and the board should understand how it's gonna be built. This is a significant project. It's somewhat constrained by these vernal pools and the limit of work, and they need to show how they're gonna do it. I think the walls are very high, not typical. I don't know that the building inspector sees a lot of walls of this nature, terraced walls, 42 foot between the three of them. That's a significant wall. That's not something that most, you know, town building inspectors have to deal with. Um, I think the board is within their rights to ask for more detail on that. And hopefully I didn't take up any more than five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, any other members of the public? Mr. Talman, your hand is still raised. Is that a failure to lower it? Thank you. Um, Sarah, Sarah, sorry. Yes, Mr. Uh, Pucci. Me. Yes, good evening, um, Sarah and members of the board, George Pucci from KP Law. I, I, don't want to uh, talk too much, but I, I just had to weigh in a little bit that, you know, typically when, when I'm at the stage of considering, you know, permit conditions, there, there are quite a bit of details with regard to construction management plans. All of that is, is typically pages and pages often in the comprehensive permit decision. So a certain aspect of it may be subject to further review later on. Say you have a uh, you know, town engineer, building inspector, whatever the, the stages uh, that you're at, you know, pre-building permit, pre-occupancy permit. 
but in your comprehensive permit, there were typically uh, quite a bit of details uh, regarding uh, construction management plan and, and the like. So I just wanted to note that to the board. Um, you know, I, I think I, I do want to weigh in at this point because we're only talking a couple of months left in the public hearing process. It would it would behoove the applicant, you know, to to kind of take stock into some of these comments that are being made and determine whether or not uh, they really want to submit some additional information for the board, because at some point you're going to just have to deliberate on that information that's before you. Um, and you've, you've heard some pretty uh, relevant commentary tonight on inadequacies so far that we've seen on these issues. So I just wanted to weigh in on that point. Well, Mr. Thank Pucci, you. would you be more, uh, more specific relative to other than us not submitting a construction management plan where we've been deficient? I mean, I understand Mr. Cody's raised a couple things that we, we certainly are gonna attempt to address, but I, 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 and I agree with you, virtually every comprehensive permit has lots of conditions uh, that are prerequisites to building permit, prerequisites to an occupancy permit, all construction related. Um, so we have no issue with that, but to submit a construction management plan, which is what people, keep referencing, it's just premature. I mean, we're, we're not gonna, it's not gonna be worth the paper it's printed on because the plans aren't defined and uh, you're not gonna get the attention of a, of a sizable and credible general contractor uh, to look at this based on where we are with the plans. So as we've said, we would be very comfortable as a prerequisite to getting a building permit, having to submit a construction management plan that satisfies the building inspector. But I mean, to ask for a construction management plan now, I respectfully disagree. I've been involved in many, many large projects that don't submit it during the, construct, the, the comprehensive permit process. Sarah, I just wanna caution, you know, again, you've been doing a great job uh, having people speak when spoken to or when asked to in turn. I'm, I'm not gonna get into a back and forth with the applicant I, but through you, Madam Chair, I'll just say, I'm not looking for a construction management plan, but we are looking uh, for sufficient information that we would put conditions in the permit that are going to be required in that construction management plan. And that is, you know, everybody keeps talking about what's common or uncommon or preliminary or not. The permits I've written have very detailed uh, conditions concerning construction management and any issue like it. And in terms of deficiencies, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna comment on the credibility of witnesses, but from, from what I've heard tonight and on the commentary, there are some serious issues that, you know, are just not addressed or inadequate or wrong, you know, at this point in the process. So I'm just expressing a little concern at this point. Um, you know, I heard just those experts that Attorney Hill presented are very credible experts. I've worked with them on other uh, matters myself, and I've seen their work in, in other uh, permitting matters, and there are some, you know, serious deficiencies on just these issues that we're talking about tonight, you know, without getting into what you've got uh, scheduled for the next meeting. So I don't want to get into a back and forth, but there are going to have to be detailed uh, conditions, and this is a very difficult site. So, you know, even more detail is going to end up being required. So you know, the comments tonight speak for themselves and the applicant can either take those seriously or not. Thank you. Madam Chair, I apologize for addressing Mr. Pucci directly and not through you. I, I won't let that happen again. I, I, would just, I would just say, Madam Chair, our objective is to satisfy Beals and Thomas uh, as your peer review expert who has uh, extensive capability and credibility. We have more uh, work to do to do that additional detail. Um, but their group is who's been retained by this board to represent the town's interests globally, not a specific subset of the public. So we will do everything we can to make Beals and Thomas uh, satisfied with our plans, just like we did with environmental partners on traffic. Uh, and that is our goal. So we will continue to work to achieving that goal. Thank you. 
Mr. Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a, a, one question or one comment on, on the retaining wall issue that was raised uh, a little while ago. Um, I, I think a comment was made that it, it, there's sort of a chicken and the egg issue here with, do we, do we make the developer design the retaining walls at this stage? Does that make sense? Um, I, I wanted to just emphasize that uh, as, as Mr. Chestia had, had noted in his letter, the, the issue is important here only because there is a massive infiltration system being proposed up against retaining walls. And so the issue is whether those retaining walls will have, wh whether it's viable, feasible to actually put these large retaining walls in a location where they will end up holding back water, which is not something we normally would want to see with a retaining wall. So that, that's why that comment was made. And then I just had a question on, on the issue of the water capacity. And I don't I don't want to, if that's something you want to reserve for the next meeting, that's fine. But I just wanted to ask again, it, is there going to be a water capacity and analysis performed by the applicant? Uh, is, and, and if that's been done, is, is that going to be peer reviewed? Um, since that is a major component of this project and it really goes to the part of the viability of the project. Um, we'll be touching base with DPW um, on that matter, um, in addition to the sewer, uh, municipal sewer, to see what um, their sense is and what additional information they feel they might need. Okay. They know more about that than I do. <laughs> um, members of the board, any more questions? John, comments? Um, no, I just took a lot of notes when um, Mr. Horsley just spoke. So um, it was all great information. I appreciate you know hearing that from experts. So thank you. Yeah, and we received those um, reports from them. I think I passed them out around 4.15 this afternoon. It was pretty late. Yeah, I read those too. So Okay, thank you. Um, Brian? Um, yeah, uh, I appreciate the work that the uh, uh, other consultants have done in, in conjunction with our, uh, our peer reviewer as well. And I think that uh, this town is fortunate that we've had uh, the citizens come together and, and be able to afford us even more information than perhaps uh, we wouldn't have had. And I'd like all those questions addressed and all those points addressed as, part, uh, as an integral part of the peer review, if that's possible. Mr. Cody? Sarah, uh, can I just uh, weigh in on that from a legal perspective? Sure. Um, I, I recommend against uh, the, your peer reviewer trying to answer comments or questions from other consultants, because that really is, the peer reviewer is reviewing and commenting uh, in their professional expertise on uh, submissions of the applicant so it's I a guess, fine you know you get a little uh, far but but that point is is very well taken about the the questions raised by the uh, third party consultants those are part of the record in this case that, that's evidence um, you know their their opinions are going to matter um, when the board deliberates so it's going to really be up to the applicant if you know, Mr. the comments I, I heard sound credible, and it's going to be up to the applicant to either choose to contest them or give additional information or uh, give a position on that responding to those. If the board finds that those third party consultants have raised valid issues uh, that the board either wants to act on in, in terms of its uh, decision making process or find that there were relevant questions that were left unanswered the board will be totally within its right uh, to rely on those third party consultants in addition to its, its own peer review. Uh, Mr. Pooch, I guess it was, I was not, the, the comment wasn't uh, for Mr. Uh, Cody to review that. I wanted the applicant to take those questions seriously. He seemed to dismiss them and saying that he would, he would deal with Beals and Thomas. I would like him to consider those uh, comments as, as important as what Beals and, Tom, and Thomas are doing. That was my comment. Thank you. It, yeah, that, I, I agree with that 100%. It would be up to the applicant to you know, take those seriously or not. And, and you're raising the issues that 
you know, you found them to be re very relevant. So, you know, hopefully the applicant will be responsive to your concern. Madam Chair, can I, can I respond to that? Yes, Mr. Angler. Yeah, we'll respond to it, okay? But the, the characters, they, I mean, we have Bowler Engineering and Allen and & Major representing us, two of the biggest and most credible, reputable engineering firms in the state of Massachusetts, not to mention Beals & Thomas is one of the best in the state of Massachusetts, as is Mr. Cody. So the characterization by Mr. Chessia, who I have had the pleasure of dealing with many times, that makes it sound like we're, you know, arbitrarily designing something is just false and we'll respond to it. But I hope the board recognizes who these experts and I have, I, I know Mr. Horsley and Mr. Chessia and I have respect for them, but they clearly have an objective based on who's paying their bills. And to say otherwise is just not being truthful. And I hope the board recognizes that. With that said, we'll respond to them because the plan works and we disagree with most of their observations or some of them, and we'll, we'll provide additional information. But I go back to Beals and Thomas is the town peer review consultant who the town spent a lot of time and attention selecting. And it is our responsibility, yes, did those peer review consultant or did Mr. Chessie and Mr. Horsley submit something for the record? Yeah, they did. Okay, so, but we have an objective. We have to satisfy Bills and Thomas and we'll address Mr. Chessia and Mr. Horsley's comments, which we received two hours before this meeting. And we'll, we'll you know, I don't have any concern about that, but please, I mean. Thank you, Mr. Engel. quite I capable. Thank you, Mr. Engler. I think you have to put yourself in the position of the board that you have a, a stated purpose of getting a development through. We have other interests in town that are have other concerns with respect to protecting the environment. This board needs to look at all of the information they receive from the pub from all sources during a public hearing. And I, I that's, that. that's the way we're going to operate. And so it's up to you whether you want to respond to the information okay. presented in the public I hearing. I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. James Mitchell, do you have any more questions? Comments? I, I think that, you know, sadly, the deeper we look, the more questions we have. I do hope that the applicant, uh, Mr. Engler, is able to address all of the concerns, um, regardless of the source of those concerns. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that he does and we're satisfied. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, I think you had your hand up. I did for a second. And that was just basically to say what you were saying, Sarah, which is that, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Angler has his own interests here. He is getting potentially some financial benefit from this. So I don't really think it's super fair of him to cast stones at experts that were hired to offer their professional opinions because, you know, clearly everybody has their own opinion here and that's fine. And we weigh that again, you know, we weigh the credibility against who they were hired by and that's fine. That's what we do, that's our job. So that's my only comment here. But Thank Madam you. Chair, I, I would agree with that. Of course, I'm the developer. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Mr. Engler, we're not going to go back and forth. Okay. okay. Sorry. Um, Sean Zahn, do you have any more questions or comments? I think everybody's pretty well covered. My same feelings. So. Okay. Um, any other members of the public who wish to speak on this matter, please raise your hand in Zoom. or asked to be recognized if you're on a phone. Mr. Carvalho. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and through the Chair, Michael Carvalho to Jersey Lane. Uh, I, I find it a bit insulting that um, folks would, uh, Mr. Engler would take the position that he had. I'm echoing your uh, comments. My concern here is that um, there are a number of, of issues that have been raised and I appreciate the board looking at those issues carefully and thoughtfully the way I know that they will. But once again, Mr. Engler is finding himself in a position of insulting 
not only the board, but the citizens of this town. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay, so I will move on to the next item on the agenda, um, which is an update on the environmental peer review. I believe the vernal pool and wildlife habitat studies are still going on and won't be included, concluded until sometime in May which adversely impacts the ability to complete the environmental peer review. Yes, um, so Madam Chair, so yes, yeah, so with me tonight is um, Andrew Gorman um, from, um, from Beals and Thomas, who has been you know, monitoring and assist has been in the field for those uh, you know, initial surveys and can speak to a, you know, a status update on those. If thank you. Sure. Mr. Gordon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Cody. Uh, Andrew Gorman from Beals and Thomas. Uh, since our last hearing on this matter for the environmental review, we have received a uh, statement of methodology from the proponents wetland consultant, which speaks to um, their intent for vernal pool surveys and uh, wildlife habitat assessments. And between the previous meeting and this one, we learned from the town that there was some interest in having us also to have a boots on the ground presence while this uh, wildlife and habitat assessments were being conducted. Um, so I believe Goddard Consulting has been conducting them over the last few weeks, which involves you know, a comprehensive survey of the potential vernal pools, some of which have been certified. Um, so we were on site on April 1st and April 8th um, as those activities were being conducted. This week, we are focusing our efforts on completing the uh, environmental peer review letter, which uh, we received materials for last week. However, we anticipate also being on site um, as the later phases of these uh, wildlife habitat reviews occur. Um, so in, in addition to that, we did receive um, some uh, the waiver requests uh, revised from Mr. Angler's office. Uh, we understand that these speak to some of the specificity that we were looking for. We have not completed our review yet. So if some of my answers tonight sound incomplete, it's strictly because we have not finished that process yet. Um, so some of our questions were related to resource area depictions. Uh, we are cognizant that the um, site is under an order of resource area delineation, which generally covers um, through the Conservation Commission process, the accuracy of wetland delineations. In some cases, the ORAD, the Order of Resource Area Delineation, is comprehensive and speaks to the entire property and all resource areas therein in constraining potential development area. So our interpretation of the ORAD as it's written and as it applies to this property, um, there's a condition number two in the findings of fact, which um, seems to imply that there's also an opportunity for additional resource areas to be identified beyond those which are uh, confirmed under the ORAD and really one of the comments that we have outstanding on the resource area boundaries is what was formally delineated as a C series on the site. Um, we're certainly in agreement that it's not an isolated vegetative wetland so it's not um, you know full of cattails and hydric soils and things like that um, but at the risk of sounding pedantic when we look at these isolated depressions um, one other type of resource area uh, could qualify for a site feature like this, and that's isolated land subject to flooding. So one of the things that we've asked for is calculations, which speak to whether or not this feature could be jurisdictional as isolated land subject to flooding. Um, and that's not something that could be hashed out through the delineation peer review process because it is an engineering calculation, specifically uh, 310 CMR 10.57 has some language as to um, how to interpret these features, whether they can hold an acre foot of water. So we may still be asking for some clarification on that, um, specifically as it you know, passes through the existing gravel path. So this is something that could be handled as a, an engineering calculation. Um, and it, additionally, I'd just like to amplify some of the comments that Mr. Cody made, and I think were discussed by Mr. Angler and members of the board. Um, so if, if we're not going to enter the arena of a full construction management plan, I certainly um, would recommend that we are looking at um, what engineering solutions are being proposed for the 
pledge outcrops that are immediately upgrading of the potential vernal pools. Um, specifically, the plans call out a silt fence and a tubular erosion control structure. I think, you know, we all un enter this process understanding that we cannot key in a silt fence into ledge. So um, we understand that these are not construction documents. So any type of information that can be provided, which speaks to potential engineering solutions that are going to be investigated with that regard. And in addition to some of those items, we've received new plans through the civil review process, which have um, some new uh, delineations of the certified vernal pool shown. And now, after these habitat assessments have been performed, we now understand that all of the vernal pools are delineated on the site, including one that is located now just south to uh, vernal pool A south. So a small addition to that area. Um, and so we're undergoing our review currently, and um, we look forward to providing the board with comments. So can you just go over with me a little bit more on what your timeline is? Um, so I think you did a review and the applicant responded mm -hmm. and you need to respond back to the applicant? Correct, yep. So we received the materials on May 5th and we respectfully request uh, two weeks to complete our review of those materials. April 5th, right? Not May 5th. Uh, sorry, April 5th, <laughs> yep. Yes, thank you. Um, so is it realistic? that we would have a pretty well finalized peer review by May 25th? Um, by May 25th or April 25th? May 25th. Sorry. So we, we intend to respond to the applicant's comments. Um, so the, the, there, there are two processes happening um, and we've received the updated waiver request um, and the response to our comments. So we're in the process now of responding to that letter as a single discrete entity, and then also responding to um, the wildlife habitat assessment as a separate uh, task item. So we consider these to be parallel tasks. So I anticipate that the board will have our response to those interim comments prior to May 25th. Um, and I, I do believe we could feasibly have a review of the habitat assessment, which again, will be happening in parallel to our review of the waiver discussion um, by May 25th. So should I be putting on my agenda, on May 11th, I have the architectural peer review on my agenda. Should I be adding environmental to that as kind of a status update type of thing, or, or you wanna wait till May 25th, just cause we're running out of time. Um, certainly. I mean, if the board uh, has the bandwidth on their agenda, we're happy to accommodate that. Um, if it's, you know, focused on the waiver request, um, we we'll, would we'll very likely have the letter to you by that time um, and okay. we can provide an update. Yep. Okay. We'll do that. And then we'll put it on for May 25th with the wildlife habitat and that stuff. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, Catherine, how you have your hand raised? Thanks, Sarah. Um, I just had a quick question um, for Mr. Gorman um, related to these vernal pools. And that was, it, it looks to me like they have identified one uh, sort of new or previously unidentified vernal pool. And I'm wondering if there's any expectation to identify um, more areas of protected resources or if they think that that one is the only sort of one that was unidentified before. Say is that this is the only one that was unidentified. And um, so just to, to take a step back, the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program has some uh, dry season characteristics. So when we're not in the vernal pool season, things that we look for that um, may trigger us to go and check these areas You know, when we're in the breeding season. And the majority of the vernal pools on the site seem to meet those characteristics, whether they're confined basins, we have leaf staining, evidence of water elevations. This new one that was identified um, there's, there, there actually, it, although it was in the wetland, there wasn't a whole lot of leaf staining and it happened to be, I think, the right time in the hydro period. And, you know, the purpose, I think, and 
Um, one of the reasons why these studies are a great idea is it gives us the opportunity to, to review and capture these areas. But at this point, I'm not anticipating any changes. Um, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. So at this point, additional information for the engineering peer review, I guess, is contained um, in the document we received, um, plus we have the outside consultants. Um, is there anything else, Mr. Cody, that we should be asking the applicant for at this point? I don't believe so, no. Okay. And the environmental, you're going to be responding next week or so, which may have additional requests um, for the applicant to respond to. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're not in the position to really discuss the waivers yet. We're waiting for that. Um, is there anything else the board would like me to cover tonight? I'm okay, Sarah. Okay. Um, Mr. Hill, you have your hand raised? Yes, Madam Chair, may, may, I ask a, may I ask a couple questions on the wetland peer review? Okay. Um, I, I was a little unclear as to what the status was of the wildlife habitat assessment that Mr. Gordon Gorman, uh, sorry, Gorman was referring to. Has that been completed and then and and submitted to Mr. Gorman, or or is that still underway and Mr. Gorman is waiting for that to be submitted? If I may, Madam Chair. Um, yes. So the the wildlife habitat assessment, as we understand it, and our conversations with Goddard Consulting. They are ongoing. Um, the applicant, uh, their proponent, has established things like trail cameras on the property that they're monitoring. Um, one of the things that we've talked about in the field um, is, you know, providing the the board with uh, sort of GIS maps that speak to, you know, rationale, methodology, um, habitat corridors within, you know, the area of disturbance versus the areas that are going to be uh, preserved on site. And I, I believe, and I, I don't want to misspeak for um, Mr. Rosine or Mr. Goddard, I believe they're targeting the end of April or the beginning of May for the deliverable of that wildlife habitat assessment, after which we'll be conducting our review. And Madam Chair, on the, on the question of the vernal pools that were on the site, and I know there's some certified vernal pools that are off site, um, but Mr. Gorman, I think said that there were vernal pools on site that are now certified. Um, I, I've, I've checked recently or actually just now with, with the uh, mass GIS map and, and they're not showing up there yet. I'm just wondering um, who's, who was it that actually submitted these to Natural Heritage and, and are we sure that they've actually certified them at this point? Mr. Gorman? Yep, if I may. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, and I apologize if I misspoke that the vernal pools themselves may not necessarily be certified I believe through this the comprehensive permit process, some of them were certified prior to submittal. However, I believe what, what's being done now is to get an understanding of whether or not they are certifiable. If they have um, you know, functioning and providing spotted salamander habitat, um, which indeed many of them are, um, we have spotted salamander egg masses throughout you know, all of the vernal pools that uh, Goddard Consulting has been investigating, as well as some wood frog egg masses in the southernmost vernal pool. Um, so it's you know not necessarily a question of whether or not they have been certified, and I believe that's a, a question that the landowner you know may be able to address as the, the property owner. But um, this habitat assessment is to kind of evaluate whether or not they could be treated as certifiable. Are they functioning as wildlife habitat? Um, you know where are the corridors in relation to the vernal pools? But I, I I can't speak to whether or not they will or have been certified. Thank you. Okay, and in my final question um, was re relating to the uh, waiver from the vernal pool regulations that the town of Manchester has. The applicant stated in the waiver table that was filed on April 5th, that 
that, uh, quote, as will be demonstrated by the applicant's consultant, the project will not impair uh, vernal pool function. Uh, so I guess my question is, at what point will the applicant's consultant be demonstrating that to the board? Um, I, I don't think that has happened yet. And um, so I guess that's a question through the chair to the applicant if the applicant wants to answer it is, when can we expect to have some kind of analysis from the applicant as to the vernal pool impacts? Mr. Gorman, do you have the answer to that or should I ask Mr. Engler? Um, I, I think that's a question for the applicant. Um, okay. Apologies. Okay, Mr. Engler? Uh, I can't say for certain, but sometime after the study is done. Okay. Yeah, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. For the record, Please. Ryan Rosine, Ryan Rosine okay. from Goddard Consulting, I'm the one uh, predominantly doing the wildlife habitat assessment and vernal pool studies. Um, yes, once we once we complete the vernal pool analysis in wildlife habitat study, um, that information will be provided and will will show the board um, as best as as um, it will the board will need to make a decision um, that the, the the proposed project will not pair vernal pool function. Um, so we will have that at the conclusion of our um, study, which will be in a few weeks. Great, thank you. Uh, Catherine. Hi, Sarah, thanks. Um, my question was um, related to, and if you wanted to defer this until we talk about sewers, that's fine. But my question was related to the um, re recharge to groundwater and um, the recharge areas that they're destroying um, necessarily through the construction of this project. And then whether there were sufficient new recharge areas being created. It wasn't really clear to me from the peer review consultants report whether the mitigation was sufficient to support the recharge areas they're destroying on top of the um, increase in paved um, pavement that will be there. Mr. Cody. I apologize. Um, no, I mean, they have <coughs> submitted recharge calculations based on like their new impervious areas. I believe Mr. Cheshire is, you know, you know, referencing some existing areas or some depressions that are now, now recharging. I guess we'd have to take a little, a little closer look at that. But as far as like the new impervious areas, um, the applicant is, you know, is initially addressing those. Thank you. Sarah, can I ask a clarifying question for you, please? Yes. Um, so I, I heard you you say that the applicant is addressing um, new areas. Um, am I understanding correctly that you you are not currently clear or you haven't done the calculations to determine whether the you know new recharge areas are sufficient to make up for what's being taken away plus the new impervious ground is that, is that right you're just saying you don't have the answer yet right yeah i guess I'm, i guess to, again i can't speak intelligent to mr chesty's comment but i mean we'll, we'll look at it a little clearer i mean it seems like there's you know there's an indication that there's there is some existing recharge on site um the, you know the site is largely you know rock outcrops ledge um different you know different depressions you know the, the very varied um topography um, you know, our, our analysis focused on the kind of like the, the, that proposed condition versus, you know, the existing, um, and then the pros, the proposed condition, the recharge seems to be adequate. If there is something in the existing condition that has been overlooked, we can certainly, you know, we'll re reevaluate that as part of our ongoing review. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, with that, we will talk about future meetings. So the next meeting, oh, excuse me, um, Patrice Murphy, you have your hand raised? You need to unmute. 
Patrice Murphy, Executive Director for Manchester Essex Conservation Trust. I just wanted to ask a question with respect to the wildlife habitat assessment. Uh, what species are being considered in this habitat assessment? Is this strictly for the Vernal Pool wildlife? Or does this include other species that have been found in the vicinity? Mr. Gorman? Yep. If I may, Madam Chair, um, so there are two oh, prongs. Ryan. Oh, okay. go ahead, Mr. Gorman. Okay. Oh, sorry, um, I, I, I'll also invite Brian to, to speak on this as well, but I believe that there are two prongs to this uh, wildlife study that's being conducted. One is specific to the vernal pools, but then uh, Goddard Consulting has also proposed um, to conduct kind of a holistic wildlife habitat study based on mass DEP standards, which we sometimes apply to resource area impacts, but this is being expanded to the entire locus. So I would invite Mr. Uh, Rosine. Thank you. Mr. Rosine, would you like to speak to it? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so with the wildlife habitat assessment, we're we're looking at all wildlife, um, not only the vernal pools, mammals, birds, um, anything that that is found on site. And so that's the main reason why we've put up multiple trail cameras um, to capture what what is using the site and where and kind of get a direction of the locations they're going. Um, so so really, we're, we're taking into account all wildlife, both on the proposed project site, the impact site and, and throughout the rest of the area that's going to be undisturbed. That answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. I will um, move on to the future meetings. Um, so here's my plan. Um, the next meeting for April 27th, we will be discussing the request to connect to the municipal sewer. Um, we'll also talk about water supply issues to see if we can address some of those questions um, from a town standpoint. Um, Wednesday, May 11th, um, we'll be doing the architectural peer review again and the environmental waiver requests. And on May 25th, we'll do environmental and hopefully be able to close out engineering and architectural as far as making sure we have all the information available. That makes sense to the board? Yep, okay. Um, then I will make a motion to continue the public hearing on the 40B application of Jeff Jeffrey Engler of SLV School Street LLC um, at School Street Assessor's Map number 43, lot number 18, filed with the town clerk on September 27th, 2021, to be continued to Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, at 7 p.m. Do I have a second? I'll second, Sarah. Catherine seconds. Any discussion? I will take a roll call vote. Catherine. Uh, approved. John. Approved. Brian. Approved. James. Approved. Sean. Approved. And Sarah approves. Thank you. We now will move on to administrative matters. I don't believe we had minutes to review at this point yet. Is that correct, Gail? I forwarded the minutes, but they probably need to be reviewed. Okay. And then approved next meeting. They were we'll forwarded though. Okay. Yesterday or the recently. Yep. Um, any other week. Is there any other matter that members of the board would like to raise that was weren't anticipated by the chair. I'm okay. You okay? 
Yeah, I'm okay. Um, then I will go ahead and make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Sean will second. Take a roll call vote. Catherine. Approve. John. Yes, approve. Ryan. Approved. James. Approved. Sean. Approved. And Sarah approves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, everybody, night. have a good night. Good night.